Aloha and welcome to our Word of Life radio program here in wonderful Okinawa, Japan. We give glory to the Lord. I'm going to read my Bible this morning. A little iPad technology, leather back, paper back, as long as it's the Bible. Raise it up in the air. Say, This is my Bible. I am what it says I am. I have what it says I have. And I can do what it says I can do. This morning, I'll be taught the word of God. Therefore, I boldly confess. My mind is alert. My heart is receptive. And I'll never be the same again. I'm ready to receive the incorruptible, indestructible, ever living, always working, never failing seed of the word of God. Say, I'll never be the same again. In Jesus' name, amen. Now say this, it's going to be a year of more and more for me, for my family, and for my church. A year of more of his goodness, more of his favor, more of his blessings. A year of unprecedented favor, more and more. This new year will bring, for the God of glory is doing a new thing. Favor will manifest for me as never before, and every door that's been shut will be shut no more. Blessings will flow like falling rain, and nothing about my life will remain the same. A year of God's goodness, I'll surely see, and breakthrough after breakthrough, that's how it shall be. I position myself now so it will happen to me by taking hold of this word and declaring it's true indeed. I refuse to let go. I won't ever give in. For the, for the best year of my life has begun and I win. More favor, more goodness, more blessings too. That's what uh, 2013 has in store for me. It's a year of breakthrough. Give the Lord a great big hand clap, amen. I believe that, I believe that. That's, uh, that's uh, on behalf of Lonnie Simmons. She took the prophetic word from Dr. Jerry Sabal and made it personal. And so that's what you just said. Turn your neighbor and say, this is your year of unprecedented favor. Turn your other neighbor and say, how are you doing this morning? You're looking fantastic. Tell them a new glory has come upon you. Come on, somebody. That's right. Now, if you're single, that's a pickup. I know, okay, sorry, I should have, I just, uh, I just, uh, I didn't go. That's my wife that normally says that. Anyways, uh, but before I get started, I want to encourage you to make sure, if you've not, you might not know this, a couple of years ago, I wrote this book called Focus, What's in Your Vision, and uh, it's a great book, um, and everywhere I go, it's one of the first books that I wrote uh, after this one came, Dream by Design, and uh, I think it would be a great book for you to consider in this new year of um, our 40-day devotion, amen, as we started 40 days of devotion, but this year of unprecedented favor, God's doing some great things, and I'm excited about the word that we have for you this morning. Are you ready? Are you ready, ready, ready? ready. All right. Father, we thank you again for your word. Thank you again for your Holy Spirit. We welcome you in this place, and Father, we ask that you would speak to each and every person, that you would make the, the word, your word. Uh, ever so real and how to apply it to our life. Father, I pray as I submit my, um, my understanding to you, I trust you with all of my heart. I lean not to my own understanding. Lead me, guide me by your spirit. And thank you for giving me the tongue of the learned. And Father, I thank you in Jesus' name. And everyone in agreement said, Amen. Isaiah 51 says, Awake, awake, put on strength, O arm of the Lord. Awake 
as in the days of old, the generations of long ago. There is an awakening in God's church. Everyone say, I am the church. church. Turn and ever say, you are the church. church. Say, we are the church. God's triumphant church. God's victorious church. Say, God's living church. Because a church is not a building, it's not brick and mortar, it is mortar, it is people, amen? And so there is an awakening going on in the church, as you saw in the video there. We wanted you to understand there is a reviving. There's nothing about God that needs to be revived. There's nothing about God that needs to be awakened. It's everything about us, amen? But the good news is if you're born again, the Holy Spirit, the reviver himself, lives on the inside of you. And as Paul told Timothy, it's time to stir it up, stir it up, stir it up, stir it up, stir it up. Now, God is building a church. We know that. Matthew 16. The Bible says, Jesus said, I will build my church. He's not just building any church. He's building a strong church. And he oftentimes has, from the book of Genesis all the way through Revelation, spoken to his people as he is here, the arm of the Lord. And he is saying to them, awake, awake, put on strength, O arm of the Lord. And he is raising, he's raising up. A strong church that is awake to his strengths. Not just one strength, but strengths. And I want you to understand that. There are many strengths that we want to talk about. uh, And uh, all of them are worthy of discussion. But in the beginning of the year, there is one particular strength that kind of filtered up as we were in prayer. And that is the strength called vision. God wants to awaken your vision. Because vision is a strength for your life. And uh, because if you are, and I believe you are, a disciple of Christ, a disciple being a fully devoted follower of Christ, then the vision that God has for you, you allow it to happen in you. Amen? And because he has things he wants to say to you. He, want, he has things that he wants you to see. He, want, he has things he wants to reveal to you. And it's important because, as Solomon said, where there is no vision, where there is no vision, the people perish. And so God has a vision for the entire creation, including a special plan for you. There's no question about that. We've rehearsed many times, always worthy of repeat. And it says in Jeremiah 29, he says, I know God speaking to all of us. I know the thought that I think towards you. Thoughts of peace and not of evil. To give you a future and a hope. A future cannot happen without a vision. And of course, in the book of Psalms 33, verse 11, it says this as it goes up on the screens. It's taking a long time there. But the plans of the Lord stand firm forever. The purpose of his heart through all generations. I like that. But the plans of the Lord Stand firm forever. Now, I said a lot very quickly, but I want you to get a hold of this. That God has a plan. He's always had a plan. It doesn't change. It doesn't shift. It has your name on it. And God has a a, a hope and a future for your life. No matter who you are, what you've been through, what you're going through, how uh, things may be in a particular area, God has always made a way of escape. God always has a vision for your life, and, um, and that becomes a strength. And I think it's important that you would understand, though, there is a God idea, and then there is a good idea, as our good friend who will be here for Super Bowl Sunday, Dr. Story, often says. There is a God idea, and then there is a good idea. And I wanted you to understand that, because last year, as I was going through, uh, last year, sorry, last week, as I began this series, wow, and um, I, you know, got, went to school and went to, a, you know, a really good school, a university, and uh, it was great. And basically, um, they don't really sit down and talk to you, per se, about vision. They may now, but they didn't when I was there. They didn't have a class called vision. They didn't have a class called what to do with your life, you know, kind of a thing. And so basically, you kind of um, go in a particular direction as you sense, feel, or are told or directed to by some counselors that don't know God or counselors that do. I I don't know. And um, and so the big question, though, in our life comes down to this. What is 
true success in your eyes? How does it look for you? And um, would you be able to describe what it is that you see? Now, it's important because, as I mentioned last year, I, uh, last, last week, as I mentioned last week, when I was sitting in a church building and I heard by the Holy Spirit, not, I mean, I heard literally, but the Holy Spirit just amplified this phrase from Dr. Young Cho, uh, has the world's largest church in Seoul, Korea, when he said, show me your vision and I'll show you your future. And I sat there and I had plans and I had organized certain things and I'd at that particular point, I'd been six years maybe through school at that time and getting my degree, and there's nothing wrong with any of that. And, uh, but I was really hungering for something in my life, and, and what I was doing was not wrong, but I couldn't really explain the vision. I mean, any intelligent person on the planet Earth can map out some pretty good steps and be fairly fruitful, and I'm not talking about pocket success, material success, um, or um, the gaining of things, or the locations of where we now live or don't live, and it may include that, but one of the things that I'm sharing with you, for me, for Art Sepulveda, my story may not be your story, but um, my testimony is I had to discover what true success was, and True success, I believe, in basic summary, is accomplishing the vision that God has had for you before the foundation of the world. I've often said this. It's been, I've shared it for many years. You can be successful naturally and miss out entirely on what God has called you to do eternally from the foundation of the world. And I want you to understand that is where I was when I heard the, the Dr. Cho speak about vision. He said, because if you cannot describe or define where you're going, then you're unclear about your vision. And so maybe that's why Dr. Cho's words echoed and resonated and actually stunned me when I heard it. Not in a wrong way, but in an alerting kind of way. And um, like I said, I had planned goals and targets that I put together. And there's a difference between a vision and a vocation. And vocation may be your vision, but your vision is not necessarily your vocation. And I want you to understand the two. For me, for me, what I'm trying to share with you is something very simple. And that is the difference really came down to this, the Holy Spirit. It really came down to the breath of God in my life. It really came down, and I only looking back, can I instruct you and say, it was God speaking to me, not about what I had planned, but what he had planned. The difference is a good idea and a God idea. And I only share that um, to help us, not to, um, to, not to uh, uh, lead you any other way. And so I want you to understand that I could be, and I could have been, and was on my way to be successful before men. And there's nothing wrong with that. But then there's a success before God. And they too don't necessarily have the same definitions. So what I want you to understand, it really is this, that true success is accomplishing the vision that God has had for you before the foundations of the world. God is not sitting out there saying, okay, I wonder what I'm going to do with this guy by the name of John. Oh, not this John, but I mean, you know, you know, John, you know, living in Bangladesh or living in, you know, M Mexico City or living in London, England or living, you know, in Singapore, Asia. I guess, you know, as he kind of works it out, I'll just kind of say that's that's OK. You know, and, you know, God is much more organized than that. And I, it's not a matter of organization. But I want you to understand it's because people don't have vision. Also, it's why people sometimes end up paralyzed in life and um, paralyzed with the fear of failure for the little that they have. And uh, they basically sit around, you know, in life, on the sideline of life, just stuck, just not really wanting to go forward. You know, they do the basics. And it's a great waste, in my opinion, 
of potential, purpose, power, as well as God's plan to do nothing. Every one of us has time, talent, and treasure. And um, all of those are investment qualities that we have. And But to do nothing with our lives, how do you get from doing nothing in your life to doing something that's significant in your life, which is available to every person in this room? It's called an awakening. It's called waking up. There's not enough men sometimes. I'm sure you can get some, and you have some very good friends that can speak into your life. Keep those in your life. Good for you. But there is an awakening that comes from the Spirit of God that can blow your ever-living mind. It really opens you up to areas and to take steps. And what I'm talking about here, my friends, is something that is so unique to the believer. Not to leave out any person, but there is a distinction and there is a mark. I'm not talking about being religious. I'm talking about being a fully devoted follower of Christ, meaning a disciple, meaning a follower of Jesus. And I'll show you that in just a second. You know, I want you to understand what's missing in many people's lives is an awakening. Is an awakening to what God has in store for them. They can't see what God has in store for them. And for me, because I didn't know what God had in store for me, what you end up doing as we are trained and as we are taught and as we are well capable of doing, taking nothing away from man's incredible capability, is to plan and to, to mark out a path that in this world is successful. True as that may be, I'm defining success in this moment as I speak to you about carrying out the vision that God has had for you from the foundation of the world. And, um, and you can know that. And it's not a secret from you. And I want you to understand, because many people uh, feel stuck because of where they've been, and what they've experienced, you know, and I want to share with you, it's not where you've been or what you've experienced negatively that matters. It's where God wants you to go that counts. And uh, I'd rather move forward and make mistakes than look back and do nothing. And uh, today I want to help us to move forward. And let me show you how God can help you and I continually in our lives. See, whatever our mistakes defeats, failures, and flops, and I've had enough. You know, Jesus came on earth to give us the power to change, to give you a fresh start in life. You see, one of the reasons why Jesus stressed the importance of being born again, because until you are born again, not just attending church and not just carrying the Bible, not just acknowledging that there's a God somewhere and not just saying, hey, you know, I think religion is okay. But until you are born again, until a person is born again, they cannot see what God has for their life. And I'll prove this to you. Jesus speaking in John chapter 3, verse 3 says this. Most assuredly, I say unto you, unless one is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Notice what Jesus said, he cannot see. He cannot see. He cannot see. See, God wants you to see. God wants you to have vision. But there are things where, where man has a veil in front of them. And men cannot see the things God has for them until they are born again. The kingdom of heaven, may I just sum it up and basically place it before you and say, you cannot understand God's purpose for your life, God's dream for your life, God's vision for your life, because it comes by way of the Holy Spirit. It comes by way of the Spirit of God. And I think, again, I take nothing away from the achievements of humankind, but you need to understand those are two different visions. There's a God idea and there's a good idea. And I want you to understand that vision is the ability to see. But until you're born again, you cannot see. That's why he says, you know, we are to walk by faith and not by sight. But he's not talking about your eyes necessarily. He's talking about your senses. 
there is a way to see what God wants you to see. And there's a way to not look at what you're looking at. Usage of words, but you'll, you'll figure it out as I go along, I trust. Vision is the ability, the God-given gift, to see those things which are not as though they were before they are. See, vision gives direction, it gives focus, it gives stability, and it gives strength of life. Vision is seen not what it is you're looking at naturally, but what God has opened your eyes to see, to pursue spiritually. And I think it's important that you and I understand why people perish when there is no vision. It's not that they perish on the outside. It's that they fold up on the inside. And I want you to understand, Solomon said, where there is no vision, the people perish. I once heard a person say, eyes that look are common, but eyes that see are rare. I heard another person say that sight is the function of the eyes, yes, but vision is the function of the heart. What I want you to understand, no matter who you are, God has an amazing vision for you, designed for you, and, but he wants you to see what he sees about you. Play on words, but until you see what it is he wants you to see, you won't see it how he wants you to see it. Things all around you look so permanent, but they're all subject to change. Everything about you, but it's not a matter of you knowing that they are. It's knowing how to change them. And your faith can change your world. And the vision that he's talking about is as simple as the Holy Spirit one-on-one -on -one with you. You're not excluded. You're included. You're invited to live in a world that's so much bigger than what you may have experienced. Take nothing away from the credit that you have. But I want you to understand, I once heard it said, it's so true. What you see is what you get. Play on words. And it's true because what you see is what you get. Because if in your vision you say, well, Pastor, I don't like what it is that I see for my future. If you don't change it, that's oftentimes what we end up with. Or, Pastor Art, I don't see anything. That's what you're going to, we have to change it, or that's what we're going to end up with. Well, what am I going to do? First of all, know that you can change what it is that you see. You have to understand that now that you're born again, you have the unique privilege of knowing that the Father, through His Son, has sent the Holy Spirit to open your eyes. You can literally say, I was blind, but now I see. You ain't feeling me, but it's all right. I'll move on anyway. L listen, remember last week I said in 1 Corinthians 2, 9, where Paul says, I, lit natural eye has not seen, and natural ear has not heard, nor has entered the natural heart of man, the things that God has prepared for those that love him. But in verse 10, he says, but he has revealed them unto us by his spirit. If I can shorten that up, I can say this. The natural eye has not seen what the Holy Spirit can reveal. The natural eye will never see what the Holy Spirit, the things he has for you, can reveal. The things of the kingdom of God, the things that give you confidence beyond your circumstances, give you boldness beyond the pressures of life, give you peace that passes all understanding, and gives you a walk that has a Holy Ghost swagger that makes people turn their head. Come on, somebody. I'm, I'm talking about. It is true. But you see, you can't be natural. You cannot be carnal with the things of the Spirit of God. The Spirit of God is not, you know, someone that's held up in the closet and every now and then you just want to acknowledge Him by name. He has come for deliberate purpose. His purpose is to reveal. He is the revealer. He doesn't come on His own authority, John 16. He comes to reveal those things. Jesus said that, um, that, 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 he, has, that he has heard from me. And I want you to hear this because it's important. That's why last week out of um, uh, Acts chapter 2, we said when Peter spoke up and prophesied from the book of Joel, he says, I will, I will pour out my spirit on all flesh. Everyone say all flesh. Meaning all creation. 
God will pour out his spirit upon all creation. And he goes on and says, your sons and daughters shall prophesy. Your young men shall see vision. Your old men shall dream dreams. Basically what that's saying is that we're in the age of the Holy Spirit's visions and dreams. But if you choose, well, first of all, if you're not born again, as Jesus said, you cannot see the things of the kingdom of God. But secondly, you can be born again and never flow with the Holy Spirit, never invite the Holy Spirit. And so he, he can't show you, not that he doesn't want to, and not that there isn't something to be shown or revealed. But you have to be awakened. You have to be open to hear what he wants to say. And I want, I want you to understand, this is something very, very powerful for us. In 1 Corinthians 2, 14, it says, but the natural man, the natural man, the unchurched man, the, un, the unsaved man, the unborn again man or woman, does not receive the things of the Spirit of God, but they are, they are foolishness to him. Nor can he know them because they are spiritually discerned. I was born again when the Lord spoke to me about stepping into the ministry. It made no sense. I'm not saying your story is my story. Follow me. Track with me. Okay. And um, I had a real passion to do what it is that I was doing. After all, you spent hundreds of thousands of dollars to get through school and to do all that stuff. And then a number of years have passed and time has come. And the time was now that I was here in Hawaii. And God began to speak to me. Now, we didn't make any logical sense. Because for me to do what God was asking me to do would seem naturally, logically, if I analyze this, like I'm throwing away years of my life and hundreds of thousands of dollars that I never had to begin with. Grants and scholarships. But still. And so it would look like I was going backwards because you have to understand when he spoke to me, how he spoke to me, I didn't have the resources. I hadn't gone to all the training. And sometimes God will speak to you about a vision that he is his purpose from the foundations of the world. You got to be careful that you don't overanalyze your vocation. Okay, that's my story. It's not necessarily your story. And, uh, <clears throat> and so one of the things that I began to do to let you know how this happened, God didn't just drop a bomb on me. Well, it kind of was a bomb. But anyways, uh, but it was I began to pray. I began to intercede. I began to seek God and fast and ask God. And I'll be honest with you, I struggled with a lot of it. Not that I didn't want to do what was being revealed to me, but I did not feel qualified and I couldn't see how this was possibly going to work out. It didn't look like it was going to work out. Are you with me? So you have to understand. But as I said last week, you have to remember that in following vision, you cannot despise the day of small beginnings. And a small beginning always begins with the first step because the first step towards God is always the right step for your life. So. And uh, you need to understand, so he began to share with me, and I began to pray. Well, things opened up, and I want you to understand, and God began to, to share. And what I want you to understand, I had to be willing to break out, to not analyze what I was looking at, the money that was spent, the time that, the years that were spent, the education that I had gone through, and the wanting to please of family members, in a good sense, not in any kind of pressure. You know, and I had to be willing to break out of that to break into what he wanted. You with me? And so that's important for you and I to understand. And God sees things about your life that you might not see about your life. Oh, my gosh. What time it is? 
Who did that? And, um, and what I want you to understand, I'll have to cut all that out, won't I? Okay, anyways, it was so good. And um, what you have to understand, it's not that I couldn't have pursued what I was going, but it wasn't God's best for my life. So he was talking to me, now me, about vision versus vocation. The God idea and a good idea. And I want you to understand, and for me, it came down to breaking small. Breaking small, breaking out of how I had been conditioned, even in a positive sense. And I want you to know that this morning, God wants us to break out in order to break into what he has for us to do. Breaking small is breaking the limitations. It's breaking those habits. It's breaking... Um, Things that have shaped us, informed us. Sometimes they're a certain direction. They're not always negative. But the goal of understanding God's vision for your life is being open to the person who's always in your life. And that's the Holy Spirit. You don't have to come to church to find the Holy Spirit. I mean, in one sense, you know, it's good. Don't forsake the assembling of yourselves together. But I want you to understand... Same time, the Holy Spirit is with you every day of your life. And he, every day of your life, he wants to speak to you. Every day of your life. That's why these 40 days of devotions is really important. But small living is a mindset, a way of living that sometimes we feel like, you know, I can't. I remember a story that I was reading out of the Old Testament. And this one particular godly king of Israel had... Um, engaged i think it was a syrian army because he wanted to go to battle and uh and the prophet came by and told this king of israel he said you you better not join yourself with him and uh, the the king of israel said but but i have to now not only have i paid for all of it but they've already come over they've committed we've made a covenant and the prophet said to the king of israel And because he was complaining about the investment that he had already made. And the prophet said to Israel, he says, is this too great of a thing for God? I mean, you think that's going to stop God? He said, if you go ahead and do this, it's not going to be the best for you. In fact, you're going to end up dying. You're not going to end up winning. And with great regret and with great investment, he listened to the prophet and he pulled away and he told us that I have to disengage, keep the money. It's just the way it is. And God ended up blessing him and prospering even more. But sometimes people have a difficulty pulling away from the things that they have done to do the thing that burns in their heart to do. It burns in their heart. It, it just burns in their heart, but they stay stuck. I call that to some degree breaking small. You see, we want to break through this invisible but real arena called living small. And breaking small is about increase in your life, in God, the plans that God has. And really, you've heard me say hundreds, if not thousands of times, somebody is waiting for you on the other side of your breakthrough. On the other side of you obeying that vision, God has a plan. And your plan might not look like mine, and mine might not look like yours, but you know what you want to be? You want to be right in the middle of God's perfect will for your life. And it's not a measure of treasures, and it's not a measure of things, although we may have that. But I guarantee you, it will always have perfect peace and total satisfaction, and God will never let the righteous go without. But I want you to understand that breaking small is about Breaking that feeling of that I'm stuck and I can't get out. That breaking small is about breaking the inability to see beyond where you're at right now. Breaking small is about breaking the negative thought habits, thinking that it sounds too good to be true. How many of us say that in the silence of our own mind? Breaking small is about breaking wrong speaking that's sabotaging God's big dream for your life. 
See, small living stops God's big plans for your life. And the most important thing, as I said last week, is do not despise the day of small beginnings. There is a day. This is a day, for example, that the Lord has made. I will rejoice and be glad in it, right? But in this day also, there is so much you can do to redirect the course of your life. And this day may be your day of a small beginning the right way. Maybe today you'll make a decision to step on the path that drips with his abundance, the path that guarantees you that he'll crown your, your year with his goodness. I would rather be on that pathway than having all the bells and the whistles that the world tries to tempt us with. See, my friends, we have to be careful because your first step is the most right step you can possibly take. I know bad English structure, but it's the way I talk. Anyways, momentum begins with step one. And uh, breaking small begins with the day of small beginnings. Today, for you, parent, single person, university student, person who's been struggling in your career, today could be that day. But you'll have to take a step because it's not enough just to know that there are steps. You can know there's a path and never walk on it. Yeah. See, breaking small means breaking Satan's small little lies. The manipulative tactics he has to keep you thinking that you can't get out of where you're at, however that measures out in your life. See, Solomon once revealed a truth where he says, it's the little foxes that spoil the vine, the little things. There was once a book that came out and said, don't sweat the small stuff. Well, you better. There are little things that are eating your lunch, but it's those little decisions, that little step that puts everything back together. One little step with another little step with another little step. I'm here to tell you that's a major step. And I want you to know today that there is a vision and a plan that if you'll follow it, you'll follow a path that drips with his abundance. God is your supplier. You know, and you have to be careful that you don't become conditioned in your life. Listen faster than you already are. But I remember a story I came across I'd like to share with you you right now. Uh, There was this man who was passing by um, a circus, apparently. And there were elephants there. And suddenly he stopped and he was confused by the fact that these huge, large creatures were being held by only a small rope tied to the front of their leg. No chains and no cages, and nobody making uh, threats. It was obvious that these elephants at any time could break away from their bonds, but for some reason, they did not. He saw the trainer, and he went over there, and he asked, talked about these animals, and he says, um, why are these animals uh, just standing there and not attempting to get away? Well, the trainer said, when they were very young, And much smaller, um, we used the same size ropes, the things that they saw, the same size ropes, to tie them. And at that age, it was enough to hold them. But as they grew up, they were conditioned to believe that they could not break away. They believe that the rope can still hold them, so they never try to break free. The man was amazed. He said these animals could at any time break free from their bonds. But because they believed they couldn't, they were stuck right where they were. The story goes on to say one line. It says, like the elephants, how many of us go through life hanging on to a belief that we cannot do something simply because we failed at it once before? They often say, have a memory like an elephant because an elephant, you know. Elephant's memory never forgets. In this particular case, you want to forget. See, in this case, the elephant never forgets. You're right. But Paul, the Bible says, forgetting those things which are behind and reaching forward to those things which are ahead. Oftentimes, we live conditioned and impressed with things that have happened in our lives, and we still hold on to those. And you have every right to be free, every right to live larger. You know, oftentimes, we don't see these things. 
Maybe we grow up in an economy or situation or neighborhood, and everyone seems to be like we are. And we think that we can never break away because whatever this is supposed to mean to you, that's where people like myself grew up in. And I don't despise it. I'm not saying to. You have to understand how I'm sharing all this. Sometimes we grow up in a, in a family that doesn't have much function to it. Well, all of us really are dysfunctional. But anyways, um, but I mean, we, have, we see things. Or maybe you grew up or every, every marriage that you've been exposed to some degree in your family life you know, gets a divorce or things happen or people fail or no one in your history has gone uh, wherever, whatever direction you might be thinking of right now. But the point is, we don't realize it, why we don't try, why we don't make the effort and not knowing that possibly it could be, not that it is, that we've been conditioned to live small. When, and that's why God says it's time to awaken your vision. Awake, awake, and put on strength, O arm of the Lord. You see, there's another story. He said, that sounds funny, but it's true. But here's a true story. Years ago in the Denver Zoo, there was a difficult decision that they had to make there. They offered the Denver Zoo the gift of a beautiful, large polar bear. And uh, the problem was that there was no existing space for it. At the time of the gift, the board of directors was in the middle of a fundraising uh, campaign to renovate the zoo in their renovation they changed the strategy to include magnificent habitat for this polar bear. In the meantime, the bear was put in a small temporary cage. What meant only to take a few more months took several years. As a matter of fact, it took three years. And, uh, and all the bear could do in that cage was to take three steps, turn around, and take three more steps, turn around, and take three more steps, turn around, and take three more steps, turn around. And that's what the bear basically did unless it was sleeping and lying down. Because of unforeseen delays, the construction took that many years, three years. And finally, the new home with its grand waterfalls, its magnificent caves and plenty of space to move around. The bear entered into its home. It looked around. It saw everything that it could have. Took three steps, turned around. Took three more steps, turned around. Took three more steps, turned around. Took three more steps, turned around. Turned around and turned around. Why? The bear was conditioned. You say, well, yeah, but I'm not a bear. Yeah, I know, but sometimes we get conditioned, you know, in certain ways that we don't even see it. And so I close with this thought. I said last week I'd share with you the five thoughts, which I can't. I can share with you one and maybe a half of one. But you have to understand what I'm about to share with you is something that the born-again, spirit-filled, church-going, church-serving, wonderful, God-loving people, you know, passionate could not see about their own lives. There are times in our lives that we cannot see what God's trying to show us. And it takes an awakening. And it takes the Holy Spirit. And it takes the Holy Spirit. And he wants to breathe on you. And he wants to speak to you. And he wants to awaken you. There's nothing to awaken in God. There's nothing to be revived in God. God is not sleep. He neither sleeps nor slumbers. You know, but he wants to awaken us. The Bible says in the book of Ephesians, you know, awake you know, arise from the sleep, and God will give you light. He wants to give you illumination. What if you really opened your heart and allowed God to speak to you that he would show you exactly how he's always wanted you to live? I want to say this to you. It's never too late to get started. It's never too late to get started. And the thing is this, and God wants to give you a supernatural um, confidence. Well, in 2 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 11, the first part, it says, Dear, dear Corinthians, Paul is speaking to the Corinthians. Again, I can't tell you how much I long for you to enter this wide open, spacious life. Amazing. Wide open, spacious life. Point number one I want to share with you. Accept the invitation. Say that. Accept the invitation. Say it again, please. Accept the invitation. Paul, by the Holy Spirit, is going to these wonderful people. Let's just say he's going to the church. And uh, he's going to the church, the gathered ones, in the name of the Lord. And he says, you know, you born-again believers that come to church and serve God and love God and, and are, are washed in the power of his blood. He says, I want you to enter this wide-open, spacious life, which obviously they hadn't. Well, anybody person would have said, but hey, you know, like some of you say, well, who are you to tell me that I'm not living this wide-open, spacious life after all? I've been given the abundant life. Yeah, being given something and experiencing something are two different things. See, it's one thing that you're given something. See, what it is, this is an invitation. This, Paul is speaking 
But I want you to get this. I want you to see it. Gosh, I wish I had it. But, you know, it's like, have you ever received an invitation, either in the mail or handed to you uh, for some kind of party or, you know, get together, you know, or whatever it is? It's an invitation. You open it up and it has your name. You know, we request the presence of, you know, you know, Arturo Sepulveda Cobrillo, Chico Chico Barra Jimenez Sanchez. Well, me. Anyways, uh, you know, to come to this incredible party, which he's just going to be absolutely amazed, you know, or whatever it is. And it may be, uh, what, whatever it is, it doesn't really make a difference. But the point is, the thing is, Paul is encouraging them to come to a place that they're currently not at. And sometimes people think, like, you can't tell me, but what God's just trying to do to them, he's not, he's not beating them down. He's not saying they're sinful because they're not. He says they're not living right. He's just simply saying, hey, there is a bigger life than what you're living. That, you know, you, you can, he's saying, live a wide open space. It's like he's not talking about tierra firma. He's not talking about ground here. He's talking about living bigger, living according to God's vision. And sometimes we think that how we handle our life is the way and the only way that it should be handled. But I'm here to tell you by the Holy Spirit that if you let the Holy Spirit breathe on you, he will open up your eyes drop scales from you, and help you to see what he has in store for you. Because if you're here right now, and in your rhythm of life, you think that's all there is, that there is no more growth, there is no more expansion, there is more, no more increase, then I'm here to tell you it's time for you to recheck the vision that God gave you. Because oftentimes we try to downsize it to fit our experiences, our failures, and our defeats. Our disappointments and our discouragements. You know, oftentimes what people end up doing after a while is they say, I'm so discouraged. I'm so disappointed. And so they shrink wrap the very vision because they don't do what Paul said do. He said, forget those things which are behind you and reach forward to those things which are ahead of you. And in verse 14, he says, I press toward the mark. You've got to press or persevere toward the mark. And I want you to understand that the reason I say accept the invitation is because he wants you to be in a place that you're currently not. And where he's inviting you to is also where he's at. God loves you unconditionally right where you're at. But he loves you too much to leave you there. You need to understand what he has for you. He's saying, I want you to come and live the biggest, largest life that you possibly can that I made available to you. He wants you. He's requesting your presence. Somebody is waiting for you on the other side of your obedience. And see, I want you to understand that oftentimes we can receive, I know I have several invitations over the many years. And we make excuses of why we cannot come. We say, I don't feel worthy enough to come. I don't feel good enough. I haven't done enough good. You know, and we end up going down this whole row of, you know, analyzing our life. We come out with logic and argument. And we say, I can't because of where I'm at. And I don't have anything to wear. And I don't feel like I'm good. And so what we're dealing with. Our feelings of unworthiness, insecurity, and poor self-esteem. And these become the little borders, the little manipulative lies that the devil uses to keep you living small. You know, I'd really like to go, but I don't feel I can. I don't feel I have anything to say. I don't feel I have anything to offer. But the one who invited you wanted you there. He wanted you there. He requested your presence. And I want you to know in this room that there is a vision that he's given to you. And he's inviting you to this wide, open, spacious life. And you know what it takes to get there? It takes faith in a God who loves you unconditionally. It takes faith. And faith is always in the now. It's never in a, well, one of these days. That's not faith. That's postponement. That's procrastination. Turn your neighbor and say, did you hear that? And I want to warn you that 
Don't let your past punish your future. God is trying to invite you. But in order to get you to where he wants you to go to, you must first accept the invitation that even, even with what's going on emotionally or physically or financially or socially or whatever, even where you may be at or a person that you know may be at, tell them the master with unconditional love has invited you out of his mercy and his grace to stand in his presence and to live in a way that you could possibly never even imagine. But it's going to take faith for you to accept it. Because I'm here to tell you, he sees something beautiful in every one of us. And that's what vision does. It breaks us out of small and into the vision he has in store for you and I. Did you receive something this morning? Come on, let's all stand to our feet. You know, we just finished that series, didn't we? Called Change the Story. Where David said in 2 Samuel twenty-two twenty-five 25. That God changed the text of my life when I opened the book of my heart. Restating that God changed the story of my life when I opened my heart. When I opened my heart. God changed the story of my life. The invitation that he's asking you to accept today. Yes, it is, of course, about receiving him personally in your life if you've never done that. Certainly it is for you to get things right in your life if, if they're, if they're uh, you know, out of order. But in accepting Jesus Christ, he is the open door, the doorway to a vision and he gives the one that gives you the ability to see the kingdom of God and what's in store for you. I'm here to tell you that and encourage you, accept the invitation. Paul said to, he said, dear, dear people attending World Life Christian Center at 9 o'clock in the morning, I can't tell you how much I long for you to open, to enter into this wide open space of life. See, the invitation's out there. You might say, ah, that's a, that's a nice idea. Do it like that. Somebody could really use that. I know somebody who can. What about you? Although your beginning is small, yet your latter end shall increase. The small beginning you have is taking that first step. But I want to assure you that there is a life of increase abundantly on your behalf. The now step comes before the next step. That's what Paul, that's what uh, David said. He said, I had opened the book of my heart. That's the now step. And then God began to rewrite the story of my life. Maybe this invitation for you is about making the decision to stop living small, to break small in your life. You know, in these 40 days of devotion that we have, I just ask you generally to make 40 days of every day devoting your life to the most uncompromised way of living that you can possibly make. Thank you for joining us today. I'm, I'm sure you've been blessed. I'd like to share with you just some information of how you can contact Word of Life Christian Center. Again, our pastors are... Pastor Art and Kuna Sapovera. Our church is in Honolulu, Hawaii. Our mailing address is 550 Queen Street, Honolulu, Hawaii, 96813. If you still use mail, you can go, go ahead and mail us, but you can also contact us via email. If you have any questions, if you have anything you want to share with us, you can email us at wolcc at wolhawaii.com. Again, that's W-O-L-C-C, which stands for Word of Life Christian Center, W-O-L-C-C at wordoflifehawaii.com. Please email us if you have any questions or if you want to share any testimonies of what God is doing in your life. And we, can also, we also have a church in Yokohama. If you're ever in Word of Life Yokohama, our pastor there is Pastor Fukiko Matsuzawa, and her phone number 
Well, let me give you her email. Um, w o l dot Japan at f l u t e dot o c n dot n e dot j p. You can e- you can also email Word of Life Yokohama if you're ever going to be in the Tokyo Yokohama area. Thank you so much for joining us. We look forward to being with you again next Saturday at 9 a.m. Until then, aloha. Aloha and welcome to our Word of Life radio program here in wonderful Okinawa, Japan. We give glory to the Lord. Tell me about the Bible this morning. A little iPad technology, leatherback, paperback, as long as it's the Bible. Raise it up in the air. Say, This is my Bible. I am what it says 